I want to thank Bruno and everyone who's been a part of this amazing, amazing event. And really, a lot of it is you guys. This is one of the best crowds I've ever interacted with. I want to hang out with you. Um, thank you for being so intelligent and curious. It's really a pleasure to be here. How many of you guys are parents of young ones who might still be in diapers? <laughs> How many of you are sleeping? All right, yeah, exactly. Um, have you ever had a moment where you had to take them into the hospital? So this moment is a shocking one. And um, what happened is I have two little girls, and they're three and five now, but at this point they were one and three. And a friend of mine was carrying them down the stairs, which he shouldn't have been doing, and his foot slipped and he tripped. And instead of falling all the way forward, he lunged backwards so he wouldn't hurt them, and his elbows crushed both their legs. So in this moment, as a parent, you're really feeling this intense anxiety, and you want to help as much as you can. Now, the good news is, is a week later, the little one actually started to walk before the, the bigger one, because she didn't know she couldn't. And what was really interesting is if you can see the one on the, on the left, Kieran, her leg, she has the very first 3D cast ever. So I was working on a project right at that time with a friend of mine, and I was you know, on the board, and I was trying to see the value of a new type of, of cast and a system for helping kids and adults, too. And I was in the midst of creating an interface for that. And so we were creating a doctor-patient parent interface. And that experience created such an incredible sense of empathy for me that it changed the way I thought about how quickly I wanted to be able to get in and out of information, how little I wanted to deal with insurance cards, how 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock to 4 in the morning at night, the last thing I wanted to deal with was complicated interfaces. So it really was an amazing piece in a bigger puzzle that eventually led to the creation of these and so back then, which was two and a half years ago, 3D casting and 3D printing was relatively new. And now it's becoming something that you guys are using every day. So there's so many amazing uses for technology and the empathy that it creates to go through an experience as someone who might be using a product or service. You just cannot quantify the difference. And so that's kind of what I want to talk to you today is about how to get this type of meaning back into our lives. And um, you know, I don't know if you've seen this graphic, but we're sort of devolving. Have you guys felt that? And at the time that I first started looking at these pictures, it started to kind of depress me a little bit about the new generation and what's happening. And now it's very public information. And these ads, have you guys seen these ads for Facebook Home? So what it promotes is uh, a girl's eating dinner with her aunt, and her aunt's talking, and she's totally phasing the aunt out, and she's texting underneath the table. And I don't know, it kind of bothered me a little bit. <laughs> I thought, it, 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 I don't know if this is something that we want to continue to promote. And so I really started to take a stance and to try and understand how can we use our amazing brains and our amazing creative talent, and how can we take something and add more meaning in our lives and try and promote something at a different level. So as I was writing, I'm working on this book, which maybe will never be finished, I don't know. But I was trying, as I wrote, I was just looking for something to procrastinate with, and I started to just compulsively check my phone, because I just didn't know what else to do, and I just kept picking it up and picking it up and picking it up, and, and I didn't want to keep writing right at that moment. And I realized that something was going on, so I started doing some research. And there's actually something called the checking habit. And this is one study that it's a stimulus, and it gives you a little bit of an endorphin, and it gives you a release to check and to see if someone has you know, sent you a tweet or you know, favorited a picture that you posted or something. It's just a constant endorphin rush. And so we are addicted to these things. And so it's actually um, part of the brain that controls habitual action. And it's not a conscious thing. It's underneath the conscious state. And so it's kind of interesting to think about our brains actually being rewired. So this is another study that I looked at, and it was a little bit scary, that says that we're actually being rewired to multitask at a higher level. 
so we aren't able to watch Mary Poppins from beginning to end. I tried to watch that with my girls and I thought, oh my gosh, this is the slowest movie I have ever seen because now the credits go at the end and everything's really fast paced and the edits are super quick because now we're being conditioned to look at short spurts of information and put our attention here and over there and over there and over there and that seems to be okay but what happened to the ability for us just to focus and concentrate? It's actually disappearing because our brains are being rewired and that's a little scary. So I think about these things and I think about how there's aspects of fun and pleasure. And this is based on a lot of research that I've been doing. And at one point, I moved it into ritual. And I thought, ritual's okay because this is still an unconscious behavior, but it's about pouring coffee in the morning, about taking a shower before you wake up and having these habits that you get into. And I could get into habits and I can understand that as part of lifestyle. But really, what I've realized lately is that it's about getting into meaning. And so if we understand how to get past pleasure and fun, we move into understanding ritual and how our products and services fit into people's normal lives every day. But the next step for us as designers and as people that are creating products for the future is getting into the meaning behind it. Much like Claire talked about in the last session, it's not about the products you're creating, it's about giving people control of their lives. So we have to think about these things and understand what is it. And looking 2,000 years ago, gosh, Aristotle had the same point, that you had to start off with the ethical approach, which is the story or the trust or the brand behind everything. And then there's this part that's completely emotional that you just understand immediately. And then there's the brain part, the part that has to take logic into consideration. And so sometimes I call it this intersection of logic and emotion. And these are the things that I think are the most important for us to understand as we move forward is how do people perceive the things that we create on a logical level? How do you perceive it on an emotional level? When you buy a car, it's extremely emotional, yet you're still looking at cubic space cubic feet, you're still, still looking at gas mileage, you're still looking at all these very practical things. Sometimes those drive us a little further. But when it comes to decision making, you have to understand your product or service, how much of the decision to use it, to keep using it, is logical and puts in that space. How much of it is in the space that's gonna be a little bit more towards that emotional gut feeling that you can't actually always quantify or register. So we're losing eye contact. We're losing social interaction, action. we're losing productivity at work, and we're losing our ability to focus. So what are we gonna do about that? We're actually the generation that can make the difference. So what we want is, we want more resonance, meaning, connection, and empathy in our lives. So that's what I've really been focusing on and what I'm very passionate about. So going from mindless to meaningful, did any of you guys um, play Words with Friends? Or do you still play it, anybody? With your, I mean, in a way, it was interesting because it connected generations. Did you find that? So you could play with a parent and that parent could get online and this was sort of a shared experience. And I thought, okay, that's really interesting because it's going from mindless to meaningful. So what's the difference between something that's repetitive and addictive and what's the difference between something that eventually goes into meaning? So. It's the end result in my mind. So if we're playing something over and over and over and over and the end result is kind of nothing, zero, then that maybe is meaningless. But if we do something over and over and over and over again and it connects us to others or it has some kind of other resonance in our lives and it integrates into our lives, then that's really lifestyle integration and that's meaning. And so the action of <clears throat> what this is, I call it the automatic space in between conscious and subconscious and I've been having kind of a difficult time explaining what the space is because there's not really a name for it. Freud calls it pre-conscious. In the 70s, the closest thing is subliminal advertising. Uh, I think there's a book, <coughs> a social grouping book, where the author calls it non-conscious. And I've decided to call it inner conscious. I'm not trying to coin a phrase. I just don't know what to call it. And it really falls between this conscious, which is aware, Everything that you're aware of, you know how much it costs, you understand you know, how it's gonna plug in, the voltage, all these things, even what it does. And then there's this deeper meaning that's way down here that is 
200,000 synaptic processors in one second that you can't even quantify. There's this place right in between that we have access to as designers, as researchers, that we can actually start to get information and pull it out. And it's this inner conscious area. So this is the thing that I am writing about. This is the thing that I'm trying to understand. And I'm trying to understand how we can design experiences that co connect to this non-conscious, inner conscious area that we can control that goes into this deeper meaning that we really don't have any control over. So <clears throat> looking again at what this is, is I, I do believe in mixed methods of research. I actually believe in gathering as much data as possible at every single situation. I'm a data lover, and I love to look at all pieces of information. And so when we start off thinking about what people do and how people live, how many of you guys wash your hands when you go to the bathroom? That's a focus group. So if we actually took a camera in the bathroom and took pictures of people as they left, some people might go, well, I don't really have to. You know, and so that's really what people are doing. There was an NPR um, kind of an interview, and it was really interesting because if you asked Americans how often they go to church, it was like 46% said they go to church every Sunday. But then someone started taking a different approach. Instead of asking that question, he started saying, OK, well, let me just interview you. On Mondays, what do you do? Tuesdays, what do you do? Really, so how does that go during the week? Oh, that's interesting. Friday, yeah, OK, well, the weekend, what are the weekends like? Oh, OK, what are you doing on Saturday? Well, Sunday, what, what usually happens on Sunday? Oh, OK, uh-huh, and, and you like to sleep in. Yeah, I know. And OK, and then, oh, sometimes you go to church? Oh, I know you want to go to church. So what happened was is they were finding out that the polls, people weren't lying. They were saying what they thought they should be doing. It was the ideal self. Just like I should be working out a certain much amount of time. I should be eating my vegetables. People know what they should be doing, and they write that down when they fill out a survey because they don't really know. They're not really conscious of exactly how often they go. They might even think that they go more than they do. But the reality was is this gentleman on NPR realized that if we have undirected conversations and allow people to tell us what they're doing in a conversation, we find out so much more relevant data now take that to the next step and actually observe people in their houses and their workplaces and around the, you know, what they do on a daily basis. And that's even more powerful, but it's not as quick. So at the minimum, we want to start doing non-directed conversations instead of surveys so we can understand what people are actually doing. Now I've sort of taken this to the next level and I see that there's a practical and kind of an emotional aspect to this. So there's things that, if you look at it, there's aware and explicit information that people are logically able to fill out, surveys and things like that. There's data that you can gather on analytical, um, Google Analytics and things like that. And then there's this unaware aspect. Now, to get to the unaware, we have to get into contextual research and in-depth interviews. And there's really no way around that. And so I think many companies are realizing that this isn't, in, it's, isn't just a nice to have, it's a must have as we move forward. And so that's kind of exciting for people like me who have been really passionate about this space for years and years. We finally get to do the work that we love. So this graphic here is actually Zynga's stock. And when I first started talking about this, Zynga's stock was at the top. And it was very difficult for me to make my points. And as the last um, couple years have evolved and I've really followed this, Zynga's stock went down and down and down. So I'm not saying anything negative about gaming. I'm just saying that in order for companies to sustain over a long period of time, we might want to think about a longer term strategy. So getting into meaning. Um, are you familiar with Khan Academy, anybody? So Khan Academy flipped the way that education happened. And it started out with a guy making tutorials you know, on YouTube for his niece that was across the country and he was a math guy. And it built and built and built into millions and millions of students. <clears throat> and now it's become a methodology where you watch the lectures at home, and that's your homework. And then in the classroom, you actually do the homework that you would normally have done at home. And it's flipped the way that people think about education. And so there's new you know, ways of using apps and using tablets and things like that to allow kids <coughs> to experience education a different way. This was a piece, I don't know if the sound is up. Every person has a different um, way 
way of learning. I'm a visual person. I like to touch stuff. So I talk. I'm telling stories. Hands on. Write it down. So we interviewed a bunch of students from campuses. We need to pay more attention to what the student's learning style is and that it's very important to not just think everybody can learn the same way because they can't. Self-consciousness is such a huge issue in classrooms and no one ever talks about it. Everybody is different, so we can't like force this like traditional read this, take notes, study it, and you learn it and regurgitate it back to me in tests and finals. In the future, the way I would like to see it is uh, you know, more groups, more, more time, more abilities and ways for people to express themselves because I think yourself they could uh, learn more so the interesting thing about that <clears throat> was students really didn't want more technology in their lives students wanted to connect with each other they wanted to learn from each other the peer and education aspect that happens at that level was huge teachers didn't understand that students had completely different learning habits and, and ways of learning um, they were talking about how they like to turn pages and write things down and experience was really the biggest key to learning. And it was a little bit anti of some of the reasons why we started doing this research, because we wanted to understand how technology fit into this. But it was interesting that technology really wasn't even mentioned by any of these people. And so doing more research, <coughs> um, Korea is actually um, destroying all textbooks by next year, or the year after. And so they're going completely digital. And I have spent a lot of time in Korea, South Korea, lately, and um, it, I don't know if anyone's from there, but there's a different culture, and it feels different when you're there. Um, and it, this was really shocking to me. Um, they're actually treating digital addiction in Korea for people as young as age three. These kids are um, getting a new level of anxiety when the battery life starts going lower. Instead of going to sleep with their teddy bears, they want to sleep with their iPads or you know, their tablets. Of course, it's not an iPad in Korea, sorry. It's, um, you know, so uh, I, 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 this bothers me. I have a three-year-old, and I want her to sleep with her teddy bear. Um, so it makes me rethink again how technology embeds itself into what we're doing every day. And I'm really in a quandary about this because I build technology. So um, one of the things that <coughs> is really fun is um, a friend of mine is CEO of this company, and we've been working with her on this technology. And it actually is just in a beta still, but it allows you to watch something and truly interact live with it with multiple people uh, across time and space. And it's an amazing technology that brings people together, and it's called Spin Together. And um, the applications are, are pretty enormous. And she was just named one of the 100 most creative people in Fast Company. Um, it's a magazine that we have that uh, came out just this Monday. So now I realize I can talk about this type of technology. So I'm really excited at ways that technology can actually add meaning to the things that we do on a daily basis instead of take it away. So the emotional connectors, we've been doing research uh, for years and years on what connects people to products and services and how we can get those emotional connectors out and dig them out. And surprisingly, not surprisingly, it maps to Maslow's hierarchy of needs where there's ease of use, there goes kind of into trust and security. Then it moves into um, identity. It moves into social connectedness. And then it moves up to dreaming and aspiration and things like that. And so we've done study after study after study after study. And we found the results map back to these main criteria. And it's going to be different for every company. Your company is going to have different connectors that fit in. Not everyone's going to you know, have five. Some people may just have one or two. But if you look at aware and unaware, and you look at rational and emotional, and someone says, gosh, I just love it. I love it. What do they mean? Well, you have to ask why, and why, and why, and why. We went through this in the workshop a couple days ago. But really, what you're trying to get to is this first thing here. And you can fit into this category and just make your product work. Don't try and do more than that. Just get it to work flawlessly. Someone just recently said that you want flawless functionality. And that is your goal. And if you do not have flawless functionality, get to this connector. It just works. And you can get there with continued iteration, usability testing, and feedback. But if you have a product or service that doesn't just work perfectly, 
then just focus on this area and you don't have to do more. That is an emotional connector all on its own. As we move up the ladder to it meets my needs, after you get the flawless functionality down, then you can start to get into other aspects of your product or service and the thing that you're creating and how it could meet someone's needs at a higher level. But the words that people are using to help us understand what these things are about the products and services that they, that they use, that they love, oh, well, they just say, gosh, it's just so me. Oh, I just feel connected. I don't know. It's that inner conscious layer that they're not quite aware of, but they're trying to verbalize it. And you have to help them verbalize it by continuing to ask them why, 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 why is that? And so it's very interesting to see that, once again, as you cluster these up, and it's not an easy task, and it's very hand done, and it's a lot of synthesis and analysis, but they tend to cluster again into these categories. And there's the outliers, and I didn't know what to do with the outliers. And you know what the outliers were? Fun, addictive, pleasurable. So addiction is part of this but it's over here, and this is not what I'm personally trying to concentrate on right now. Now, it's already, there's so much written about it, and it is a mechanism, and there's gamification, and it's all okay if you can help people get engaged with your product or service using those techniques, but those techniques are well mapped out. These are the things that I'm really looking at. So experience happens at a number of levels, and like I mentioned before, there's 200,000 synaptic things that happen in a single second from something that you might have experienced as a child, or a cereal box, or a logo, or a scent. There's nothing more strong in terms of evoking a memory than a particular smell. And I remember a friend of mine said, oh, I'm creating this new thing. And this is the same friend, actually, that was doing the cast. This was 12, 15 years ago. And um, it was a smell meter And this guy at one meeting said, oh my gosh, I have the perfect name for it. It's going to be called I smell. And again, this is 12 or 15 years ago, so he didn't know what he was even talking about. But what it was, was it was this thing that was a companion to gaming, and it sat and it looked like a genie bottle, and it would chemically produce gun smoke smell, or fire, or being in the woods, or all these different smells that would go right along with the game experience that you were creating, and it would immerse you, at least logically, that's what they thought. It would immerse you into that experience. So as we can say that there is, we can see that there is no eye smell out there right now. But the sensory aspect of the experience is so huge, and it's really hard for us to understand that. In the product space, that's been around for a long time. We're shifting into a product space, so we're creating services, we're creating products, but now we're kind of migrating in with the physical product world and ID. And that sensory aspect to product design has been part of the methodology all along. So there's a lot of product methodology that we're actually drawing from these days to kind of help us understand how to better connect with our customers. So one guy, just as a joke, thought, gosh, look at Farmville and what's happening. I'm just going to create cow clicker. So what it is is there's a cow, and then you can click on it. And then you can't click on it again for 15 minutes. And this thing got downloaded so many times that he couldn't even believe it, and he created it as a joke. You've got mail. Do you guys remember that sound at all? So there was a comfort to that because AOL launched and a lot of people didn't understand what the internet was. And when that would come on in the middle of the night when you were checking your mail, it was very comforting for a lot of people. Even the, um, the iPhone, the home button, has way more emotional connectors than you might expect. It has a tactile aspect, so it's sensory. If you click on it, you know you're always going to go home, so there's a comfort there. If you double click on it, it does something different, so it's discoverable. I think there's even a triple click that you can program, which I've never done. And it, 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 it actually has this satisfying feeling. If you're just in your pocket and you click on it, it's satisfying. So that little button actually has so many little emotional connectors that we can't even imagine why you know, people really, really are attached to that. So nostalgia is really a huge thing. So the Nest thermometer um, is a big thing in, in the US. And I'm a little bit surprised that it didn't come up in the connected home um, talk. But it's sort of changing the way that people feel about controlling you know, their time and space and home. And you can set the uh, thing from your bed. You can actually turn up the heat before you get out of bed, one person told me. And you can monitor it over time, and it sort of automatically adjusts. And it looks really cool. 
And somebody said that the, really the best part for them was the feeling that they got when they turned the knob. It just felt so satisfying. It just felt great. So all the different aspects to what created this new thermometer is really working to connect to people at this emotional level. And also, it, it goes into ego. It just looks great. Your house all of a sudden could be in Dwell magazine if you get a Nest thermometer. So it makes you look cool as well. So these things, satisfying, intuitive, and delight-inducing, those are mapping back to those emotional connectors. And again, you guys are each going to have your own emotional connectors for your own companies. But these are the new brand attributes that you need to think about. So why finding briefly is about listening to it people didn't say. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I have some flyers up here that I just printed just for you guys, and they're like $4 each, so I really hope people come and grab them after the session. <laughs> um, but we're, we're trying to um, kind of understand the methodology that we've been going through to get to these emotional connectors a little bit more. My goal right now is to get published in the New Yorker. There's no higher honor than getting published in the New Yorker. I saw an article where the, the makeup was just fabulous. I mean, how do I get to that point? I don't want to work at a store for the rest of my life, but it's the easiest thing right now. Sometimes clients are just like, shoot me an image, and they can see it right there right now. And I can do video, same thing. I'm on Facebook. I'm on there all day. I'm not actively engaged in it all day, but it's like, it's kind of on all day. I want to take the 14L up at 24th and Mission. There's one in one minute, one in six minutes, and one in 20 minutes. I, I still live a paycheck to paycheck, so you know when I buy something large, it takes up a huge chunk, chunk of that everyday paycheck. The brands that I choose, I pick because of their ability to be used in a variety of ways. I think it reflects my personality in the sense that you can't just wake up one day and do something. You have to have put effort into it, and everything is a step. You know, so I've always done really well with brands that have steps in their process. You know, this is good design. It's nice. It's good, but this is way better. Why? I, I don't know. I think it's just simpler. It feels vast. It's a huge, dark space. It feels it. It's the tiny stuff that changes everything. I just get like flushed with emotion, and it just kind of overwhelms me. And I... So Genevieve Bell, who couldn't be here, really inspired me to be an ethnographer. And she calls us deep hanging out. And I could go back and hang out with all three of these people, and I just spent two days with them. Actually, one day, two hours each. So I always try and go to at least two locations with each person. It was me and my friend that had a camera. Um, yeah, when you have a camera, it's a little more obtrusive, but I like to tell stories afterwards to try and help the clients engage better with the people that they're trying to create products and services for. So we really believe in that. And we also can dig a little bit deeper and find out what are the unmet needs. What are the things that people really are looking for? What are the things that are important? And what are the things that are going to truly be incorporated into their life? So this is sort of a, a mapping of emotion <coughs> across time. And then um, this is a contextual persona where we're trying to look at what the emotional connectors are for those individuals. And also, we want to look at them in context at least three different places, two different places. and then. This is something that we like to look at, not only what are they doing, but what is a specific instance in what they're trying to do from a task perspective, and are they able to complete that task? So it's very interesting to think about context and why it's important, and this is called a time slice, where you can actually see a particular moment in time and understand why that moment was so frustrating. My writing down why a frustrating moment happened versus showing a video of it in, is, is totally different. There was a video that we had recently of a woman that was trying to check out of a store and she had two kids with her and her kid finally got to the point where she just stopped and said, excuse me, I have to do this, and she spanked him. And, and it was that whole clip we ended up showing to the client and they were just, oh my God, can't believe it, because she was having so much problem with the actual interface that she was looking at. So <clears throat> really bringing us back to that point in time, um, this is one method that is called ESM, which is Experience Sampling Method. And it takes sort of aspects of time and place. And it doesn't work right now as well in terms of us gathering data. But it helps us understand at a quantitative level what people are doing and experiencing on a regular basis. And people are working. MIT is working on this. Um, Nokia had been doing a study to try and understand a little bit more about what those emotional moments are and how you can track them over time and get a statistical result, which is something I'm really excited about. 
And finally, getting back to the meaning point. You know, I was looking six years ago when I was in Europe, and I didn't have my phone. I was writing postcards. I was journaling. I was listening to my iPod. And I was taking trains all through Europe. And it was completely different than now. And so really, how do we get back to kind of this moment? This is an interesting graph about how people don't advance as quickly as we might think. And so technology is improving like this, but people are still kind of doing this. And so maybe we can help them do this a little bit better. Um, yeah, it's all about kind of getting to that meaning point and mapping it back to your organizational culture. And I could talk a lot about that. But I think that if you can take a few of these things and sort of bring them back to your workplace and explain to them and show them stories and pictures from doing research on your own, it really helps get the mindset into a different place and understanding why moving in this direction as a company and as a culture and as a longer term strategy is very important. Uh, this was funny because one of my younger uh, designers, I guess, he's, he's kind of a senior designer, but he was at home, they got a phone that didn't have caller ID, and when it rang, he said they just all would stare at it. And they didn't know who was calling, and it was like every call was a surprise. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so weird. And so, you know, when we look beyond and we look into the future, what are we creating and what kind of interfaces are we responsible for? And in the end, how does it connect with that person in the most meaningful way possible? So I think I'm out of time, but I just wanted to leave you with a final thought is that we don't always know exactly how our products are being used. <laughs> and in t instead of wondering, why don't you go out and find out? Thank you very much.